Switch. And I'm looking at them, they're all relatively hard. Do you know how to do all of them, or should we just begin at one? Um, I figured out how to do one, okay. um, but I'm stuck on two. All right, let's look at two. There's an important thing to recognize when you're trying to do these identities, and that is something like, okay, can be mm -hmm. one minus sine theta, one minus cosine theta, can even be sine theta minus one or cosine theta minus one. If I can multiply that denominator by the conjugate, I'm going to turn it into 1 minus sine squared theta, and that can all be replaced with cosine squared theta. So that's the goal. Okay? And the rules say that you can take any fraction and multiply it by the number 1. Okay? So here's my number one uh, right over here. One plus sine theta all over one plus sine theta. And this is a common technique whenever you're doing these trig identities. Okay? And I'm only I'm not multiplying both sides of the equation. I'm just multiplying that fraction by the number one. Okay. okay. What that turns the next row into is this is the difference of squares. So when you multiply it together, you get sine squared theta, which is cosine squared theta. So the whole denominator becomes that. Now, the trick. You may or may not have to distribute this, but let's check out this part of it. Over here on the right, uh, no, I'm going to do it over here on the left. Cosine theta, cotangent of theta. Well, how do I want to write cotangent of theta? As 1 over tangent. Yeah, but we're looking to turn it into sine or cosine. So, What's cosine over sine. Yeah, you want to use the quotient identity. So, it's cosine over sine, <coughs> which is cosine squared over sine. So, this is... Cosine squared theta over sine theta. And now that cosine squared of theta can cancel with the cosine squared of theta in the top. You see how? In other words, I, I could basically move this sine of theta all the way to the bottom. Now let's in fact do that. Let's put that sine of theta that is in the denominator of the numerator, getting it out of there, and now that's in the numerator, I can cross that with that. So now what I have on the left side is 1 plus sine theta all over sine theta minus 1, don't want to forget that, and that needs to be equal to cosecant of theta, which we know to be the reciprocal of sine. So let's do that subtraction. How do I do that subtraction? Um. get a common denominator. Always yeah. remember, when you are dealing with a fraction and a number, it's no different than dealing with two fractions. You have to get a common denominator. Well, 
common denominator is sine theta, which turns this into sine theta over sine theta. Okay. Now, right. your common denominator is sine theta. When you operate on the numerators, that sine theta gets taken out by that sine theta, and you're left with a 1. Well, yeah. 1 over sine theta is equal to that. You've proven the identity. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And the key technique here is this, when you spot something like that, almost always you're going to have to multiply it by its conjugate. That's the way you can reduce that. Because there's not a whole lot you can do with that otherwise. In other words, all of our Pythagorean identity, if that was 1 minus sine squared of theta, then we would just replace it immediately with cosine squared of theta. But since it's 1 minus sine theta, you can't do a lot with that, except multiply it by the conjugate, which usually works out. All right. <coughs> How about number three? Let's take a look at it. I don't know, is this one we did? This looks, I think this is one we did. Because I remember that what we decided to do was turn everything into sines and cosines, which isn't much. That's the only thing we have to turn into sines and cosines. Everything else is already in that. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to replace that with sine over cosine. And then it's just a lot of complicated algebra. Yeah. Once again, first thing you need to do is subtract that fraction from the number one. And then change that whole ratio to reflect that. And eventually you'll get something on the left to look very similar to what we have on the right. I don't think we want to re spend our time redoing that one. Yes. Yeah. All right, what I notice is that they've got some of these really crazy hard ones over here. For some reason, my cursor won't show up when I try scrolling left. How come? Oh, there it is. All right. <laughs> uh, like number four. Okay. Now, when I first looked at this, I said, what in the world, sine of 3x? And then I realized that this has to be a sum to product identity. Have you been taught those? Because that's pretty high-level trig. Most students taking trig in high school do not spend a whole lot of time with sum to product and product to sum. And the reason is, is that the, it's used in calculus. It's not really used in anything previous to calculus. So if you're taking calculus, it's real important to know how to do these. But prior to calculus, it's pretty strange that students are given much problems with these. Um, I do have the formula in my book. And we could definitely substitute it for sine of alpha plus sine of beta, alpha being x, beta being 3x. But it turns into a gigantic algebra problem. And I'm reluctant to spend that much time on it tonight. Let's see. Yeah. Let's progress through the most likely problems on your test. And you might get one of these, like number four, but you're not going to get a lot. Um, yeah. So let's come back to that if we have time. I hate to spend a huge portion of the time on problems that I know you're not going to spend that much high a portion on the test doing. In other words, right. if you run out of time on the test, that's the problem you're not going to do. Okay? okay. Number five is quite a bit simpler. It's the first thing I'm going to do on number five. 
I think we may have done this one also, but it's worth doing this one again. Uh, do you? It's the first thing I can do. And usually, if you don't know what to do, uh, how to begin a, a verifying trig, do the only thing you can do. What's the only thing I can do here? Um, foil. Right. Square that term on the left. So what do you get when you square it? Um, just side squared and cosine squared. No, right. that's not what you get. Foil it. You had the right words. When you foil it, you don't get sine squared plus cosine squared. There's a middle term. Uh, sine times cosine. Well, there's two of them. In other words, when you foil it, here's what you're doing. Sine x plus cosine x times sine x plus cosine x. Well, you have to multiply that times that. You have to multiply that times that. You have to multiply that times that. And you have to multiply that times that. So what you end up with is sine squared x plus 2 sine x cosine x. Notice that you get one from this one and you get another one from this one. Yeah. Plus cosine squared of x. That's the new left side of that equation. Okay? Now, what's worth noticing here? Always remove that. What's that equal to? Um. Sine squared plus cosine squared. One. Okay, so this now becomes, there's the 1, plus 2 sine x cosine x, and this is supposed to all equal 1 plus sine of 2x. Well, sine of 2x is a little unusual. What's the identity for that? What's the double angle formula for sine? Uh, it's 2 sine x cosine x. Yeah, in other words, you can almost assume that it has to be that. <laughs> Otherwise, this would not yeah. verify. So, if this is to verify, then this better be equal to that. And it is. Uh, usually, they make you tell, they ask you what the double angle formula is, and you have to give them an answer. And this one, they're actually going the other way. They're giving you the double angle formula, and they want you to recognize that that thing is equal to the sine of 2x. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's look at 6. Another one that oh, I'll bet this is product to sum. Got to be. Um, yeah, in other words, I'm not sure how much, again, we want to use of our time doing this one, but here's the general formula. The, the sign Hmm. No, I'm wrong. This is not going to be that. Um, yeah, let's play. Let's give it a little bit of time. It's just so unusual looking. Yeah. We look at this. That's definitely the more complicated side. Might be the side we should start. On. Notice that I can factor out a cosine squared. Of from every term, right? Yeah. With sine x minus 2 cosine squared x plus cosine to the fourth of x 
sine x. Okay, you with me? Yeah. Well, there's a cosine squared x there, there's a cosine squared x there. So we effectively have to prove that this here is equal to sine to the fifth of x. Now, Right. Um, sine to the fifth of x. I don't know. Let's come back to this one also. Um, this is one of those crazy, silly, hard ones that the teacher wants to stump everybody with. Uh, I don't want to waste your time trying to solve it in real time. Um, yeah. If I knew how to do it, I would show you. But I'm going to have to think about how to do that one. It's just so strange. It might have something to do with product to sum. Um, but product to sum is where you have the sine of x cosine of y, or a and b, let's call it a and b, and that's equal to a real complicated thing, one and a half times the sine of a plus b uh, plus the sine of a minus b. So perhaps we can take our sine to the fifth of x and turn it into something different and then use this product to sum. I don't know. Um, maybe by tomorrow I will have these two figured out and we can come back to them then. Let's go on. The rest of these don't look that hard. Um, Let's see, I believe we did seven yesterday. Remember how we did it? We brought the sine x yes. over to the left, so we had two of them, and took the root two over to the right, so we had sine x basically equals negative root two over two, which means x was a 45 degree angle. Yep. Okay. Um, same thing we did number eight. We got tangent squared x equals one third, making tangent x equal to plus or minus one over root three. We solved that one. Number nine we did a quadratic in sine x. And so you factor it just like you would a regular quadratic, and you go from there. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm, I'm sure we did those three. And we might have even done number 10. Did we do number 10? Uh, no. Okay, let's talk about it. Because, first of all, the first thing you want to notice with 10 is that it's two different trig functions. And it's very hard to solve two different trig functions. You've got to be able to convert one of them to the other. Which one can I convert the easiest? Um, I don't have a nice identity for what cosine x is equal to in terms of sine. But I do have a very nice identity in terms of what sine squared x is equal to in terms of cosine. Yep. So what's so, sine squared of x equal to in terms of cosine? Uh, cosine squared minus 1. It's 1 minus cosine squared. Yeah. Make sure you don't get it backwards. Uh, in other words, you, you're always starting with this. Sine squared x plus cosine squared x equals 1. 
Notice that is all I've done is subtract the cosine squared x from both sides to get that identity. Right. Well, if I plug that in, all of a sudden things look nicer. Now, if I multiply it by 2, I get this. 2 minus 2 cosine squared x and then plus our cosine x minus 3 equals 0. We did this one because we put everything on one side and it becomes a quadratic in cosine x. And you're going to solve it exactly the way we solved number 9. Only we're going to factor it cosine x plus or minus something. Okay. okay. All right, let's move on to these half-angle problems, unless you know exactly how to do it. Okay, so I say that that is a half-angle problem because we don't have any triangles that tell us how to find sine of 15 degrees. We have a calculator, but they want you to do this um, without a calculator, and in fact, they want you to do it using the sum and difference formula. So, let's use the sum and difference formula. What two numbers could I use that would come to 15? Uh, What two common angles? Your common angles are 30, 45, 60, 90, 0, so forth and so on. So find yeah. two of them that either add to 15 or subtract to 15. Uh, well, 45 and 30. Okay, but it's got to be subtraction. Yeah. Well, that's equal to 15. That's all we need. Okay. Now, let's tell me what the sum and difference formula for sine is. Uh, so, sine of A times cosine of B minus... Uh, yeah, plus or minus sine of B times cosine of A. Now plug in everything. Or just plug in 45 for A and 30 for B and choose the right sign. So sine of... Uh, yeah, let's go ahead and do it before we come up with that. Cosine of what? Cosine of uh, 30. Is it plus or minus? Uh, minus. Correct. It's the same thing that it is there. In other words, in the cosine sum and difference, it's the opposite. But in the sine sum and difference, it's the same. So now we have the sine of 30, cosine of 45. And I highly recommend you write that step right there. Don't do some of this arithmetic in your head. It's just an easy way to make a mistake. Okay. Now, let's translate everything. What's the sign of 45? So, uh, sign of 45 is root 2 over 2. Cosine of 30. Um, root 3 over 2? Yeah. What's the sign of 30? What uh, yeah, the sign of 45? Uh, you can tell why you want to have these on the tip of your tongue. Yeah. Because you've got to do a lot of these. you got to know these four basic trig 
you want to know sine and cosine of that first quadrant. You want to you want to have those on the tip of your tongue. Otherwise, it's going to take you too long to do these problems. Okay. Now that simplifies, oddly enough, to a very common answer on these problems. Well, there's notice that when I multiply those two together, I get root 6 over 4. I multiply those two together, I get root 2 over 4. I can subtract those, I get root 6 minus root 2 over 4. That's the answer. Yep. And that's the final answer. I don't need to, I don't need to break that down in. Okay. Okay. And Oddly enough, I could have used the half angle formula, which would have been the sine of 30 over 2, which is 15. But the half angle formula gives me everything in terms of the 30. So all, I know all the trig functions of 30. So that actually might have been a little easier to use. Oddly enough, it doesn't give you this precise same answer. It gives you a much weirder looking answer where you have a square root inside of a square root. But it's the uh, same number. Uh, no, anyway, they ask you to use some indifference. So we really didn't have any choice on this. Okay. Now, yeah. let's look at tangent. First of all, what's the tangent sum indifference? I can help you memorize this a little bit. I was having so, trouble with this one, and I realized how to memorize it. It's uh, numerator. Tangent, tangent A minus tangent B. The numerator is the same as the top sign. So, oh, plus. so it's plus or minus tan B. Tangent B. And the denominator is the opposite of that. And so it's 1 minus or plus, and then the product. <laughs> and tan times tan. OK? Sorry. So there's the identity. And, and now let's figure out how to express 5 pi over 12 in terms of two angles that are the same. Now, if you're really comfortable with working with radian, um, this is not that hard to do. But um, if you're not comfortable working with radians, then you can convert everything to degrees, figure out two degree measurements that come to that, uh, and then convert everything back when you're done. Obviously, it's going to be quicker if you're Good with working with radian. Okay. Well, notice that if I have, here, let me do it this way. What is 5 pi over 12 equal to? Well, how about 2 pi over 12 plus 3 pi over 12? Yep. Well, that is a 30 degree angle. And that is a 45 degree angle. Okay. Okay. So I, I didn't really need to convert it. It's all I needed to do was split up the 5 pi and hope I got two angles that are either 30, 45, or 60. And I did. So it's real easy to split up this one. So okay. what I've got is what? The tan of what? Uh, tangent of two pi, or uh, uh, round that to pi over six. six. Yeah, pi over six. Uh, plus uh, three pi over twelve, which is pi over four. Yeah. In other words, you want it. You want these things to be either thirty, forty-five, or sixty degrees. Because we know everything. We know what the tangent of each of those is. We know what the tangent, A or B, we can 
now saw. Okay, now let's plug it all in. Let's plug it in before we solve it. So tell me what to write. Tan of what? Uh, the tangent of pi over 6, and it would be plus tangent of pi over 4. Um, over 1 minus tangent of pi over 6, tangent of pi over 4. Now we can fill in the numbers and simplify. Uh, I'm going to do it in blue over here on the left. So starting right there, what is that? <coughs> um, Tan of 30 degrees, what is that? Remember your two triangles. Oh my god. Um, Everything is based on those two triangles, Demetrius. You really want to memorize those. You can solve every first quadrant common angle just from those two triangles. So draw your 30 60 triangle and label its dimensions and then tell me what the tangent of 30 degrees is. Okay, if you're having to look it up, then I might as well tell you. Okay, here's the triangle. Here's your 30 degrees. That side is 1. It's always 1 opposite the smallest angle. That side's root 3. That side's 2. So tell me what the tangent of 30 degrees is. Uh, one. What? One. No, it's opposite over adjacent. So it's oh. one over root three. One over. Okay. okay, so that's what the first term is, is one over root three. We're not going to worry about rationalizing that for the moment. Okay. Now, for the tangent of 45 degrees, you need this triangle. So which it's is one and one. And root 2. So what's the tan of 45? So it's 1 over... Is it just 1? Just 1. Yeah. All right, so that's the whole numerator. Is 1 over root 3 plus 1. Divide that by the denominator, which is 1 minus, no, that's 1 over root 3 again, multiplied by 1, which I don't need to write. So I have that. Now, how can I simplify that? Here, let me erase. I'm going to need some more writing room, so let me erase this. So how do I so, simplify the numerator? <coughs> Again, don't worry about rationalizing it, just add those two numbers together. Yeah. So, it's root 3 over root 3, then, because if you do the common um, I think it becomes 1 plus root 3 over root 3. Okay. Right? Because this 1 turns into a root 3 over root 3, and then I'm adding the fraction, so I'm going to add the numerators and leave the common denominator. I get that. And again, you'll notice I don't rationalize it, and you're going to see why in a second. The bottom becomes 1 minus root 3. Excuse me. The bottom becomes root 3 minus 1. 
all over root 3. And now, if I flip and multiply, in other words, I've got a fraction over a fraction, right? Uh -huh. The way I do that is by flipping the bottom and multiplying. So I'm really going to take this numerator and multiply it by root 3 all over root 3 minus 1 instead of that. Now you can see why I didn't worry about rationalizing it. That cancels with that. So my answer is 1 plus root 3 over root 3 minus 1. And that is a perfectly legitimate answer. Uh, they might want you to rationalize that. In other words, we do indeed still have an irrational denominator. And this kind of depends on your trig teacher, whether he cares about that. Most trig teachers don't anymore about rationalizing the denominator. But in a problem like this, they might want you to rationalize. The thing, because I'm, I'm not going to ever be talking about the reciprocal. So how do I rationalize that? If you had to rationalize it, how do you rationalize this? That's our answer, but it's not rational. So what you do is you can multiply that thing by 1. Okay? Here's what our 1 is going to be, the conjugate of the bottom, always. Because if I multiply it by the conjugate, it turns rational. I'm going to multiply the top and the bottom by that. There's my number one. Okay? Okay. The bottom becomes three minus one or two. That's what the bottom becomes. The top becomes, I think, three minus two root three plus one, so four. 4 minus 2 root 3, I can now divide top and bottom by 2, and I get 2 minus root 3. That's actually the final answer. So it was definitely worth rationalizing that answer. We definitely got a simpler looking answer without an irrational denominator. Okay. All right. Solve the triangles and find the area of each. Okay. If you have a right triangle, the area is really simple. It's one half the base times the height. But if you have a non-right triangle, which is the case with all of these. Not so easy. If you have a non-right triangle, something like that, I might know that length, but I don't know that height. So it's not so easy to figure out the area without these three equations that they give you, where the area of a triangle is equal to one half, one side times the other side. So you have that much of the normal formula, but it's also times the sine of C. Mm -hmm. And this can be written in a couple of different ways. You can write it like this, one half AC times the sine of B. Or you can write it one-half BC times the sine of A. All three answers have an A, B, and a C in it. Okay? Okay. So, let's see if we can apply that to number 13. Number 13, we have an A, we have a B. But this angle 
not C. Hmm. 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 Well, notice that the instructions say solve the triangles, first of all, and then find the area. So I was trying to do it in the opposite order. Okay. First of all, we have to solve the triangle. And once we solve the triangle, we'll have little a, little b, and little c. We'll also have angle b and angle c. So we'll be able to use one of those formulas quite easily. But we need to solve the triangle. So what are we going to, what method are we going to use to solve this triangle? Uh, uh. There's only two. There's the law of sines, there's the law of cosines. Which okay. one do we use with this one? The law of sines requires that you have a side and its opposite angle. As long as you have that, you can use the law of sines. Okay? okay. Notice 14 does not have that. 14 does not have a side and an opposite angle. On 14, we're going to have to use the law of cosines. But okay. you always want to use the law of sines where you can, because it's the easier one. So let's solve this triangle. I'm going to draw a picture of this just because it'll help. Um, Let's see, that's angle A, that's the reserves are 20.5 degrees. This is little b, so this is 31. This is little a, that's 12. So there's the drawing. Now, we have a couple of considerations here. First of all, we need to determine whether it's ambiguous or not. Whenever you have angle, side, side, no, excuse me, um, and label this, this is, this is 12 here, sorry. Or this is angle A, and side A is opposite angle A. And they gave us side B, but not angle B. So let's start with solving for angle B. What's the law of sines say? Always start your law of sines with the two that you have. In other words, we have a side opposite an angle, and we have both of them. So, start my equation. So, um, sine of uh, 20.5. It's the only angle we know at this point, and that yeah. is angle A. Over 12. Okay. Equals uh, sine of, oh wait, no. Yeah, sine B over 31. Yeah. Notice we wouldn't be able to do C right away, because we don't know anything about C. We don't know angle C, and we don't know side little C. So you have to know one of them. What this does is this relationship holds true for this entire triangle, regardless of which angle you're talking about. All is going to be that same ratio. Okay. So. Okay. Uh, you got your calculator? Um, no. Hold on. I need to grab it. Go ahead and grab it. Okay. 
Notice is all I did was multiply both sides of the equation by 31. Now, okay. figure out what sine of B is. Not B, but sine of B. In other sine. words, yeah, put that in your calculator right there. That's the sine of B. So it's uh, 0 0.904. You in degrees? I believe so, yes. Okay. So, yeah. Point nine zero four. Yeah. Okay. Now, don't round that off and take the inverse sine of that. And that'll tell you what B is. In other words, that's the sine of B, but we need to solve for B. That's our next goal is to solve for angle B. Uh, two point six nine five. So two point six nine. Mm, yeah. Doesn't sound right. That's not an angle. For one thing, this angle needs to be much bigger than 20 degrees because it's opposite the side that's 31. Mm. So this angle, even from our picture, this angle needs to be about 90 degrees at least. So to check whether you're in radians or degrees, look up the sine of 30. What is 50 it? or 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Okay, so you're in degrees. Now look up the inverse sine of 0 0.904. Oh, 64.69. 64.69? Uh -huh. Okay. Now, as with all of these problems, find out the supplementary angle of that. So, in other words, subtract that from 180 always as the last second step here. Uh, 115. Okay, we'll just round it off. That's fine. Okay. Now, the question is, can we have two different triangles, one of which has a B of 64.69, and the other one of which has a B of 115? And the answer is yes, you can. The other triangle looks, has exactly that same 20 degrees, but this triangle, That thing is 12. Hmm. Hold on a second. Ah, my drawing has screwed me up here. Um, <coughs> hmm. For some reason, can't use that same logic when it's drawn like this. Um, and yet, it is the same, because it's side, side. Eh, actually, it's not quite the same. This is side, missing angle, side, angle. Whereas when you have the ambiguous case, you always have angle, side, side. So this might not be a, a possible ambiguous case. And in fact, let's assume it isn't. We're going to not consider that angle. Okay. We've solved for B. I'm going to, I'm going to round these off. This is crazy how they give you these decimal angles. What is the purpose of that? Um, 
And now we can solve for C by merely knowing that that triangle has 180 degrees in it. So okay. C is 95. Okay, I'm going to round that off to 20. So we got 20, 65, and 95. All right. Just, it serves no useful purpose to have those fractions in there when you're trying to get somebody to understand the concept of it. Um, just makes it more confusing. Uh, so there's our triangle, and we still need to solve for little c. Okay, so okay. let's go back to this basic sine of 20 over 12. We know that applies to all sides. So I know what that third angle is. It's 95. What I don't know is little c. Well, little c goes right there, and that angle is 95. So now I can solve that to get little c. Okay. So little c is going to be um, 12 sine of 95 divided by sine of 20. Let's see if we can come up with that number. Uh, 34.95. Okay. 35. Now, we've solved the triangle. We've done their first request. Okay. Okay. Now, to get the area of that triangle, <laughs> notice we still can't use our normal area formula because area is base times height. Well, we know the base is 31, but we don't know this vertical height right there. And these formulas that they give you, basically you're solving this triangle to get that vertical height. But if I want to pick any two sides, let's pick the area, not A, but the area, is equal to one-half B times C times the sine of A. We have all of those. Okay. Well, that's okay. one-half, 31, times 35, times the sine of 20. There's your area. So first you have to solve the triangle, and then you, you can pick any of the three, actually. There's three area formulas um, based on two sides and the included angle. So once you get two sides and the included angle, you can use the area formula. Notice that that's actually what we have on 14 is we have exactly, precisely what we would need to calculate the area without solving the triangle. However, the directions say solve the triangle. So we have to solve the triangle first, but we could calculate the area immediately because we have two sides and we have the included angle between those two sides. And that's what you have on 14. <clears throat> All right. The what are the two situations where you have to start the problem with the law of cosines? What kind of triangles? Uh, One case is where you have side, 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 and that's the only thing you know. Those three pieces of information cannot. Clearly, you don't know any of the angles, so you can't use the law of sines to begin, but you right. can use the law of cosines on this problem. The other situation is where you have side, angle, side, which is exactly what we have here. We have a side, 
We have the angle in between those two sides. So it's side, angle, side. Again, on side, angle, side, you do not have an angle and its opposite side. So you cannot begin it with the law of sines. And that's pretty much the formula, is always begin it with the law of sines if you can. If you can't begin it with the law of sines, then begin it with the law of cosines. So number 14, can't use the law of sines yet, but we can use the law of cosines. What am I going to use here? Let's use the law of cosines that begins with a squared on the left side. Because we don't have that. But everything else on the right side is going to be either B, C, or the cosine of angle A. And we have all of those. But what goes on the right side? What was the so I think the Pythagorean theorem started off like that. So a squared is equal to b squared plus c squared. So 15 squared plus 10 oh, squared. On. I tell you what, oh. let's make sure that we've got the general. What's the rest of it? Because if you get uh, the general, then it's just a question of plugging in. So my... 2BC cosine of A. Yeah. We know it's cosine because it's called the law of cosines. So it's never right. going to be it's never going to be sine there at the end. Okay, so now let's plug everything in. We don't know A, that's what we're trying to solve for. That's let's see. 15 squared is 225. 10 squared is 100, so that's 325. Minus <clears throat> 2 times 150, that's 300. Cosine of 115 degrees, which we're going to have to look up. That's not, a, that's not one we can figure out without the calculator. Go ahead and come up with that number right there. So, 325 minus 300 uh, cosine of what did you? Uh, 451.6. 451. So, I've got a problem here. Um, how many negative signs do I have? In other words, this is what you put into your calculator, right? Yeah. What it can't come up with. So cosine. Came up with a negative in front of your answer. Correct. Cosine in the second quadrant is negative. That's why I know that it has to be negative. Oh. So what was the number again? 300 times cosine of 115? Yeah. So negative 126.78. Seven. Yeah, 78. Which means now you need to add that to 325. So a squared is equal to what? Four fifty one point seven eight. Now take the square root of that and you'll have a. Twenty-one point two five. Okay, so now I can go up here, and I can say now we've got the key piece of information that we can finish the problem using the law of sines, and that's always the way you do it: is you only use the law of cosines for first step, never more than one step. <laughs> Always the next step is either the law of sines or just figuring out what the third angle is. Well, we only still have one angle. So what's the next equation I can write? So start with the one relationship that we know is true. And you can put either, either one in the numerator and either one in the denominator. It doesn't have to be little a over the sine of angle a. It could be 
sine of angle A over little a. Okay. So you tell me which one you want to do. Let's just do sine of one fifteen over twenty one point two five equals sine of B over 15. Okay. And now multiply both sides by 15. So the sine of B equals that. What's your calculator tell you that is? Now sine is positive in the second quadrant. So mm -hmm. this is going to be a positive number. Uh, uh, I don't think I got it right, but 0 0.63. Yeah, that sounds right. Oh, okay. I mean, it's got to be between 1 and minus 1, right? Yeah. And that is. So I'm not checking it with a calculator. I'm going to let you do that. But now you have to solve for B. In other words, that's solved for the sine of B. So what's B equal to? Uh, 39.05. Degrees. Degrees. Okay, the yeah. degrees, okay. So angle B equals 39.05. Well, we got <coughs> five of the six pieces, right? Yep. What's the easiest way to get the last piece? Uh, you could do sine of B over B. That's, that's the harder way. There's an easier way. Oh, that's the harder way. Yeah, because we know two of the angles now. We know angle oh. A is 115. We know angle B is 39. It's real easy to figure out angle C. Um, Just subtract from 180 the sum of these other two. So 180 minus uh, 20 plus 39 plus uh, 119.7. No. Three angles have to add to 180. Okay. So I'm going to subtract. The sum of these two. Well, what what is one fifteen plus nine? That's one. Oh yes. Oh, one fifteen. Yeah, Oh, this is twenty five point nine five degrees, and now you've solved the triangle. And now you can use that area formula, any of the three you want, to get its area. Okay. Okay? And that's a good place to stop. Um, and I will we'll pick it up from here tomorrow uh, at 4.30. Sounds good. See you then. All right, Demetrius. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.